All right, RJ. You know what this is? This is the first podcast we've had since the Kraken season has started. We're three games in, three different results, three points. But, you know, overall, I got to say, I'm really optimistic. Three goals for Brandon Tanev. But yeah, three goals for Brandon Tanev. A lot, a lot of good stuff going on here. But I got to say, I'm really optimistic about how this team has looked, where I think they're going so far this season. It seems like, you know, the rest of the fan base is too. I mean, it's just a really good time to be a Kraken fan. There is. I mean, they're they're playing games for one. I mean, that's awesome. And I think we should all be encouraged by the results. You know, you've got a little bit of everything, you know, every kind of result you can have. But at the end of the day, this is a very skilled team. And I think skill wise, it's one of the top teams in the Pacific. Uh, there are just a lot of reasons to feel optimistic. And they still have players coming back, too. You've got Yanni Gord. You've got Kelly Yarncroke, who we haven't even seen yet. Uh, so... Yeah, I think, you know, look out Pacific Division. I, I think uh, the Kraken are, are poised to do pretty well. Yeah, and, you know, we've had some minor injuries like Vince Dunn missing that last game. or We're already seeing the depth that the Kraken have come in, pay dividends. You know, they're not really missing a step when something like that comes up. So that's that's really good to see. Um, we'll go ahead and get into kind of, you know, what we've been seeing from the team. Of course, you and I have been doing the post-game live show over on YouTube. That's been really fantastic the response to that's been awesome the amount of people we've been getting the community engagement we've been getting both with us and amongst each other in the chat that's been a very welcome surprise for me and um you know so i just want to throw that out there if anybody listening hasn't participated in one of those yet you know come on come on down check it out we we have a lot of fun there yeah we do it's a great time and thanks everyone who's joined us there yeah so you know, kind of overall thoughts on how the team's playing so far. There's been, you know, definite ebbs and flows as far as maybe energy or pressure that they've wanted to put on. There are times where they just completely dominate play, regardless of what team they were going against. We saw that at the beginning of the Vegas game. Um, we, we've seen that in places during that Nashville game and then, of course, against Columbus. But then there's just other times where it's just they are back on their heels. They can't seem to... Get anything going, or they're collapsing in on themselves trying to play this ultra conservative brand of hockey in situations that really doesn't call for it. Yeah, I mean, it's momentum has played a huge role for the Kraken in these early games. Um, and I think that's part of, you know, all coming together for the first time, having those first few games, and maybe being a little emotional, you know, it, it, in a good and bad way, you know, as things go good or bad for you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think they just need to be a little uh you know a little i don't know not too high not too low i guess is how i would describe it you know to kind of fall into the type of game that they want to have and we've seen them kind of build an identity uh so far you know around a strong four check you know fast transition and making good passes and uh you know we've been seeing those kind of things so they know the team they want to be it's just a matter of you know making sure you get that all the time yeah and you, you know, you mentioned them wanting to have a fast transition. I felt that that's one of the areas that they've been lacking so far is they don't really have a transition game as far as having like a set system for it. Um, I've mentioned a couple of times during the post game shows for a couple different games now that the defensemen don't always look like they know where they should be going with the puck as far as breaking out of their own zone, really trying to catch, you know, the other team as they're skating back, you know, a lot of times the Kraken are like entering the zone. There's already three or four members of the other team there, right? That's a little less than ideal. You generally, you want to really be pressuring those defensemen, getting them skating backwards, limiting their ability to stop the rush. Um, Cause you know, the Kraken as, as big and physical as we've talked about them being since they've been announced, the roster has been announced at the expansion draft. They have speed, you know, a lot of these guys that we think of as like, oh, they're hard four checkers, guys like Brandon Tanev. He has clearly shown, <laughs> you know, unless he's out there against somebody like McDavid, he can be the fastest guy on the ice. But, uh, you know, it just doesn't seem like that system is all set. Everyone's not quite on the same page when it comes to that transition game. But I think that's going to be one of the things that will help them sustain some of the pressures that they haven't been able to sustain so far this season. You know what I mean? Just as far as getting the puck out of the zone a little bit quicker, getting it back into the other zone, maybe establishing in the offensive zone for a little more time. Um, but but what do you think as far as the transition game? Yeah, I, I've got to agree. I think it's a little bit 
lacking so far, especially I'm surprised considering how much they seem to work on it in training camp. I mean, that seemed like one of the things they worked on the most. It seemed like, you know, every other drill was, you know, on, on the rush, in transition, breaking the puck out of their own zone. Uh, but I think one of the things that hurt them there is that, especially you mentioned with the defense moving the puck out of their own zone and not knowing where to go, the D pairs were different every single day. I mean, you didn't really get a whole lot of continuity there. Uh, you know, from one day to the next where you can kind of build on where everyone's supposed to be. And I think we've seen a little bit of that struggle so far this season, given that the defense pairs have kind of been mixed around. Now, that's partially because you've got like the Vince Dunn injury, partially because you've wanted to get other guys like Carson Soucy, who wasn't in the lineup game one. You obviously want to get him in the lineup, uh, you know, after that. So, yeah, I think that's probably what it is. And they still have, you know, it's only played three games Right. So I think you still have a lot of time left to build on that, but it's definitely something that they should be working on and where you'd like to see uh, a little bit more continuity in the D pairs. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it does feel like guys are really starting to gel, like the uh, Larson Alexiak pairing that's clearly kind of established as their top D pair right now. Um, they've led the, the team in ice time the last two games as far as defensive pairings have been. They're, uh, they really seem to be getting it done both ends of the ice. We've seen Alexiak jumping into the play offensively a lot more these last two two games. Uh, Larson's obviously strong both both ways, so that's been good to see. Um, and you know what? They've spent the most time together since mm -hmm. the start of training camp. I, I don't think that that's completely unrelated. Yeah, no. And then you know we saw in game one Giordano with Flurry Hayden Flurry, and then. You know, since then it's been Carson Soucy. I've really liked that Carson Soucy pairing with Mark Giordano, um, especially kind of as that second pairing. What about you? Yeah, I thought they had a little bit of a rough first game together uh, in the Nashville game. There were a lot of times I felt like they couldn't break the puck out of their own zone as well as I would have liked, but they looked a lot better against Columbus. So, I mean, which makes sense. They're two very good defensemen. You know, they seem to work well together now that they've had a little bit of time together. So I like that pair going forward. Um, and I mean, Giordano, like he just makes whoever is playing with him look so good. And not that they're not good on their, in their own right, you know, Hayden Fleury and Carson Soothe, both good defensemen, but uh, the way that Giordano plays, it really helps out his D partner a lot, especially with both of those guys having to play on their offside. They're both lefties having to play on the right side. And Giordano does uh, help them out a lot with that as far as his positioning and the way he works the puck to them. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, on the last pairing we've talked, Jeremy Lauzon's had a rough start to the year. He had a rough preseason, rough start to the regular season. He's starting to show some signs of getting a little bit better incrementally, but he's still, you know, every game there's a couple plays you can point to that are just, you know, fairly significant breakdowns from him that have either led to goals or led to some really high scoring chances for the opposing team. That being said, we've been getting excellent goaltending from Grubauer, who has started all three games. That was maybe a little bit of a surprise, um, but he's looked really, really strong here to start the season. He's been fantastic. I mean, just dialed in, especially at the end of these last two games, you know, in the third period, there's just, you know, you figure there's no way that the other team's going to beat him. And I, I think... He's been so good that it's almost gotten into the heads of some of the Kraken players like last game where they figure, OK, we can kind of just, you know, just sit back defensively and he'll just take care of the rest. Um, but, you know, when you've only scored one goal, uh, you might need a little bit more goal support than that to help him out. Um, so I think he has masked a few things uh, for the team, but you know, it's never it's never a bad thing to have a goalie who's just on his game the way that Grubauer has been. Yeah, he's definitely, you know, picking up right where he left off last year, where, of course, he was nominated for the Vesna. Um, you did mention it, though. They have they have been kind of, you know, we, we've been calling it the shell on the postgame shows, us and, and the rest of the community. They get very, very conservative whenever they have a lead. We saw it in the Nashville game where they had a two-goal lead. They started really, you know, pulling back, and ultimately they let in another goal. Saw it in that Columbus game. Again, as you were saying, a one goal lead going into the third period yes Grubauer has been fantastic but a one goal lead is in the NHL is not enough to just kind of rest on your laurels and try to coast through a whole 20 minutes of hockey thinking you can just escape from that game I mean I don't think this is a hack stall thing I, I just can't imagine any NHL level coach being like oh we got a one goal lead all right let's really shift focus don't take any chances guys I, I just I can't 
I, I just have a hard time believing that that is what it is. But but clearly there's something going on because it's not like it's, oh, it's just one line or one defensive pair. The whole team is doing this. Yeah, just line after line as they go. And it's as soon as the third period starts. It's like something in that intermission where they think, okay, well, we've got to defend the lead now. Um, and I think it's just kind of a team mindset thing. I don't think it's coming from the coach, you know, outwardly or anything like that. Um, but I mean, it's, it's natural to think that way too. When you have a lead, you want to defend it. You want to play strong defense. Uh, but you have to remember that you've got to take some chances of your own. You've got to keep your foot on the gas. Uh, and that's a message that I hope that Hackstall does. Cause now as a coach, when you see that happening, you have to, intervene and let the players know okay no we've got to keep our foot on the gas here the next time we're in that situation let's do a little bit more offensively and you know we can stay focused on playing good defense but you know you don't want to just sit back entirely so that's something i'm hoping that i'm hoping that hackstall really preaches to the team next time they're in that situation in the second intermission in the locker room you know to say all right guys you know let's keep going here yeah because you know we talk about in that Nashville game, they only had one shot on goal in the entire third period, and that was the empty net Tanev goal. So essentially, they had no shots on Soros that whole period, uh, which is really wild to think about. And then, yeah, it's just, it's a very kind of awkward type thing. I'm with you. Hackstall's probably going to step in next time the situation comes up. And, and, and I got to think, you know, Giordano and the rest of the leadership group will as well, the more veteran guys on the team. Um, just because it's, it's an odd thing to see, especially because it's not like, you know, oh, we're 30, 50, whatever amount of games into the season, and we've been able to do this before, right? Like, first game of the season you were playing you know you were trying to claw back from being down too early against Vegas and then so you know you were playing from behind all that first game you you tie it and then lose in a controversial fashion but then to just come out that next game with this kind of mindset and then carry that into even the next game after that it's kind of odd like that's usually something you'd think you'd see from like you know, a team that's just ripped off 10 or 11 straight wins. It's like, oh yeah, no, we got this. Everything's fine. Not a team just starting a season, especially a team that hasn't played together before. It's, it's very odd. Yeah, it is. I, I, I don't really know what to make of it. I just, uh, we'll, we'll see if it becomes a larger pattern, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you can make, I guess, you know, the odd things can happen when you have a team that's never played before and is just starting. So, you know, We'll see if it continues, but uh, hopefully it doesn't. Yeah. Now, we talked about goaltending and the defensive pairs a little bit. We might as well round things out and talk about some of the forwards we liked. Um, obviously, Brandon Tanev on that scorching 100-goal pace that you know we all saw coming, right? We all knew he was going to lead this team in goal scoring. Uh, I'm sure many of us hoped he would just because uh, we're all big fans of you know what he brings on and off the ice. But, you know, is he the most surprising forward story for you so far? Uh, I, you know, I, I think he is just because because of the of the goal numbers he's putting up. I know one was on the empty net, but just I didn't see that kind of finishing ability uh, that he had throughout the preseason so far. You know, he's he's a great player. We know what he does. He brings energy every shift. Um, but I, I just didn't see that kind of finishing ability. And then, whoa, there it is. Uh, so that's been a big surprise. Uh, another forward I wanted to point out, um, who has you know, somewhat of a similar role to Tanev, um, but just you know in the bottom six or to Tanev's defensive role anyway, is Nate Bastion, who I've been impressed by, especially in his own zone. And I think Hackstall agrees with that because when the Kraken, it was late in the game, they were spending a shift in their own zone, and um, Haxtell sent out that second line, the Wenberg line, right, with Wenberg and Donskoy. And he'd kind of been rotating uh, Barry Boulay off. Barry Boulay didn't play much in that third period. Uh, and he put Nate Bastion up there to, you know, defend in a one-to-one -one game. And that shows that he, you know, that he trusts him and that, you know, he's played well defensively. And I, I just like what I've seen from him. He's been very physical. He's been one of those you know top four checkers for the kraken he's used his body he's done everything that you would hope that he would do um and the advanced stats look good too i mean i think uh well th through the first two games i checked he was the top leader in you know fenwick four percentage and considering he had the uh lowest offensive zone starts on the team you know that's pretty good it's only a two game sample size but you know 
the eye test matches the uh, the advanced stat, so I like what I've seen from him. Yeah, no, he's been fantastic. Four check, back check. As you said, he's been playing very physical. It's obvious he, you know, he's giving a hundred and ten percent out there, which is all you ever want to see from you know any player. Um, you know, going back to our our squirt coaching days, right? Like that's that was the number one thing we wanted to see as as coaches was just the effort level, knowing that you know when players you know, give that full effort level, eventually good things will happen, right? Nobody nobody sustains that super high level without, you know, scoring at some point or making a big stop defensively, goalie getting hot, right? It's it's just impossible to do. So you always want to see guys that, that really go out there and play like that. The top line was something that a lot of, you know, us speculated on all through you know, kind of the off season. Once we knew what the roster was was at the end of July, was you know okay, who's going to center Schwartz and Eberle? Because we you know kind of all knew they were going to be the wingers for that top line. Ended up being Jared McCann. We all kind of had questions about that going into training camp in the preseason. He seemingly answered those through his play in the preseason. He looked very comfortable with those guys. They were all developing chemistry through the first three games. He's been pretty pretty good. Um, he scored a couple goals off of the other team, uh, literally. <laughs> um, but you know, overall that first line is, is maybe the one place where you can point to forwards wise that, that maybe quite hasn't lived up to the hype. Yeah, they, you know, they were such an engine offensively for the team in the preseason, uh, that you kind of expected them to, you know, drive the bus once the regular season started and they've been all right. You know, they've they've been decent, but it's really these those other forward lines that have contributed the most, you know, scoring wise in those big moments and everything. So, yeah, I'd like to see more from the first line. And depending on when Yanni Gord comes back, as good as McCann has played, I think it does open the door uh, for Gord to slot in on that top line. I really got the feeling the coaching staff wants to give him a shot there. Uh, so we'll see, you know, if that can improve things or, you know, where it goes. But I think once they come home also, so like we heard a lot about uh, Jordan Everly. Well, the fans figured Everly was, you know, kind of underwhelming. We heard, you know, I would like to see more from him. And he's one of those guys that's too talented to to keep down. And I think we'll see him heat up just like Brandon Tanev. I don't think he's going to stay on an 82 goal pace. I don't think Everly is going to you know, stay on the zero goal pace. I think things like that are going to even out. Yeah, for sure. Though, you know, I will say I've liked McCann's willingness to shoot the puck a lot. I think that's really important. And I actually have something about that, you know, from a, a league wide standpoint that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but I, I have appreciated that from McCann, but yeah, I, I just think maybe something gets going. They seem to have the most offensive possession time. Like, like when that line is out there, the puck generally ends up in the other team's zone, right? They are pushing offense. It's just, they haven't been scoring goals. Like, like there's something missing there um, that that isn't you know it's just not quite working even though it's it's close. So yeah, maybe maybe Yanni Gord comes in and he's just that thing that takes it to that next level. And McCann then playing a little further down the lineup, maybe not having to go up against top level competition, can shine a little bit uh, more in a role like that. Overall, as far as the forwards, been really really happy with everybody. Forecheck has been consistent lines one through four i feel like that effort level all that stuff want to see them you know kind of crash the net a little bit more that's something that we've talked about during the post game shows where you know that's where goals are scored in the nhl today right like yes you can snipe one sometimes or get a good one timer shot from the point something like that but consistently scoring in the nhl today is just kind of caused by that chaos up front you get the puck loose up there off a rebound on the goalie right the D is scrambling, trying to find it, trying to clear it, while also trying to manage where you are, maybe keep you out of it, right? All of a sudden, they have maybe one too many jobs to do all at once. The goalie, it's really hard for them to see, kind of looking straight down like that without, you know, also losing you offensively, just given their, you know, vision limitations. So it's it's one of those things where you can quickly have the other team either lose the puck or lose you, which opens you up for, you know, some opportunities at some empty netters or, you know, not, you know, tech not technically empty netters, but the goalie being out of position. And and that's what I feel like, you know, some other other teams have used against the crack and we saw Vegas do that for some of their goals. But 
you know, the Kraken, they've had a couple of those moments, but I don't feel like quite enough. And you look at those heat maps too. If you see, you know, on Twitter with the analytics, the heat maps, you see where the shots and shot attempts are coming from. And through all three games so far, there's been a pretty stark difference between the Kraken side and their opponent side. Where the opponents, you see big circles right around the Kraken net. You know, a lot of chances from up in front, and the Kraken are more around the perimeter. You know, they've still been scoring pretty well from those chances. But those aren't the type of goals that you can count on forever. And it's easy if you stick to the perimeter to kind of run cold sometimes. Uh, you want to be sending guys, sending bodies to the net. I can only think of really one instance last game where the Kraken did that successfully. And they got unlucky. The puck just bounced over a couple player sticks. Donato, the last of them. Um, but that's the kind of chaos that you can create and take advantage of when you go to the net like that. Yeah, so, you know, that's one thing to look for. Um, that's something I think both of us would like to see that, you know, we think might help translate to a little bit more scoring. Otherwise, kind of had this sense through the preseason, definitely have that sense now. This is just going to be a team that I just feel like every game is going to be like a one-goal game with this guy, with this group of guys. It just It's just got that feel, doesn't it? Yep, sure does. I mean, through three games, all of them one-goal games, I just... Uh... You know, watch your heart rate. It's going to be a long season in that regard, but it should be a fun one, right? You know, it's no fun just looking at a five nothing game in the third period, just kind of waiting for it to end. Um, it's going to be a fun season. Yeah, I was going to say it's exciting nonetheless. Obviously, you always feel like you're in it if you're maybe down by one. You're always kind of living by the edge of your seat if you're up by one. But either way, it makes for good watching. And it benefits you with the NHL's point system with those overtime loser points. If you can just get all your games to overtime, you know, you got a minimum 82 points, right? Um, so it's going to help you a lot having those close games. I was going to say, do you want to have that debate right now? We, we, we oh, kind of avoided gosh. it during the last post game when they when they got that one. I know you're not a fan of it, of the loser point. I am a fan of it just because I think it adds a little bit more randomness to the overall standings, having that one point in there. Just, you know, I understand the argument from like an individualized perspective, but I just think as far as creating a little bit of chaos in the overall standings and the playoff picture come the end of the year, I think it's worth it for that alone, personally, just for that excitement and keeping more teams feeling like they might be in it late into a season. It does that, but is randomness really what you want in the standings? I, I think what you want out of the standing is to separate the good teams from the bad teams. Um, and I understand it makes a lot of playoff races closer, but what it also does is if you play really well throughout an entire season, it's so hard to distance yourself from other teams that are still with, you know, 10, 20 games left still in it. And it kind of diminishes the importance of early regular season games. It's something that if you're newer to hockey and haven't, really experienced the full season yet um you may not have experienced yet but these early regular season games they're exciting and everything but with the loser points it does kind of even out by the end of you know by the end of january february where no team is still really out of it as unless they you know if they hit a big run in march or something you know they can get right back in the playoff picture whereas you know playing really bad hockey for a few months <laughs> you know it, it can all be kind of canceled out. But you're saying that like it's a bad thing. Like, don't we want as many fan bases to stay engaged, going to games, increasing league wide revenue? Everyone makes more money that way. Everyone's invested in the sport. Everyone's watching it increases viewership, which increases opportunities for, you know, bigger games on TV on, you know, non obscure channels, which has always been the NHL's problem. Like, like to me, that's that's it accomplishing what it's there to accomplish is, you know, it, yes, it's making more money for the league. That doesn't necessarily translate to us as fans, but it, it is keeping things exciting for us. And it keeps a fan of a team that might be going through a rebuild or coming out of a rebuild a lot more engaged where they might otherwise, you know, we see it in basketball where there are some fan bases that, yeah, you know, come, come February, they just don't care anymore. Like we don't want, I don't want a league in which half the fan bases don't care halfway through a season. I mean, you want parity, but if the teams are actually close, I, that's there's there's a balance there between you know reflecting which teams are good and which teams are not, and then propping up teams that you know later into a season that aren't just aren't very good. 
Um, I understand the effect on, you know, league revenue, all that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, I, I think you want just a better indication of, of which teams are good, which teams are not. And also the perverse incentive to, um, to just play for overtime. I mean, certainly in these games that are non-conference games where you see two teams that it's a tie game in the third, neither team has the incentive to go for the win at all until they take it to overtime. I mean, that's the kind of thing that I, I don't like seeing where, you know, there are teams that just have this incentive to go to overtime, get their points and not play aggressively at the end of the third. I think if you took away the loser point, you'd see a lot of teams try and end the game before it gets to the, you know, randomness of three on three overtime where, you, you know, you never know how it's going to go. Yeah, I mean, you say randomness of three on three overtime. I say arguably the most exciting that NHL hockey gets at times just because, you know, it's really fast paced. There's lots of creativity out there, right? Like that's that's it in its kind of, you know, purest pond hockey form is is the, some of those three on three things. And, you know, I know the shootout has been debated for years. We won't get into that specifically, but it is something that fans enjoy. And I think ultimately sports are an entertainment product. I think we should do what, what benefits the most amount of fans. And I think that's to, to keep the loser point around. Um, the other thing is, I will just say, if you, you know, if you really want to reward good teams, we wouldn't have a playoff system the way we have a playoff system, right? Like you'd say, oh, an 82 game schedule, whoever wins the most games at the end of that, they were clearly the best team. That's a large sample size. Instead of just throwing 16 teams into this randomizer, essentially at the end of the year, where we see first seeds virtually, like they hardly ever win the Stanley Cup. So, you know. I, I, okay, I, this is this is a good way to end the argument because I, I agree with you on that. The regular season needs to mean more. There needs to be um, more of a reward for getting a high seed in the regular season. You know I agree with you on that. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's a good place to leave it because, um, yeah, I, I think we both agree the regular season needs to have a little bit more meaning than it does now. Yeah. All right, so as we kind of look more league-wide, I think we should go ahead and start in the Pacific Division and just kind of see you know, where the Kraken are standing there. Uh, as of recording this kind of mid-afternoon on Sunday, um, the Kraken are technically at second place with their three points. They're they're tied with Vancouver there. Um, both teams have one win, one loss, one overtime loss. Edmonton, obviously we knew they were going to be one of those teams most likely to, to kind of be a lock for one of those top three playoff spots in the division. They, they've looked pretty good so far. Um, I mean, it's it's really early to be kind of doing this, to be talking yeah. about like, oh, where do you think everything's yeah, got going? got a few teams who just played one game. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's, it's a little early to be saying that. Obviously, things are pretty wide open just based on where they are. I will mention for Calgary, they lost their opening game, which marks 12 years in a row for them. Um, which is one away from the North American sports from tying the North American sports record of 13. And that's shared uh, across a couple leagues uh, from a couple teams. So that's just something odd to throw out there. But uh, I like uh, that. Stuff. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> yeah. Um, but as far as, you know, how the divisions looked, everybody's looked good and bad, I would say. Right. I mean, we've seen good games from all these teams. I mean, I guess I get such as, apart from Calgary, who's only played one game and they lost by three, and the Sharks have only played one game and they won by they one. They looked pretty good and bad in that one, though. Yeah, I was gonna say they've all they've all looked that way. Um, I I haven't seen anything to make me think that it's not gonna be Seattle, Edmonton, and Vegas. You know. Yeah, I mean, as far as the teams at the top of the division, you know what we thought. Nothing has really changed my mind so far. I mean, we're early on, but I think the biggest news in the Pacific is a couple of injuries the Vegas Golden Knights are having. And we both figured, you know, we did our Pacific Division preview. We both figured Vegas would run away with the division, right? They're a very good team. You know, they're pretty stacked. And, you know, they, they had a lot of points last season. But they're facing some adversity early on. Um, they have a couple major injuries they're dealing with. Max Pacioretty out about six weeks. And uh, Mark Stone is out. Well, we don't know how long. Uh, still waiting on an update for that. But doesn't sound very good uh so that's going to be a big blow to a vegas team that you know if they do lack anywhere it might be you know on those high-end forwards without those two guys i mean you're looking at 
Chandler Stevenson is your as your top setter and what wingers do you play him with you know that's that's going to be uh difficult for the Golden Knights to overcome over the next well month or so you know we talked about it's only a few games in but this is something that's going to impact them for a while in Pacioretty's case for six weeks or so yeah and you know it's a kind of a good opportunity for the rest of the teams in the division to kind of try to capitalize on that. I think Vegas is a deep team. Um, they're still going to win plenty of games over the next month and a half uh, that like patches might be out. Um, but, you know, obviously you're, you're talking about losing your captain. You're talking about losing one of your top scorers. It is just hard to replace guys like that in any lineup. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, hopefully – Seattle can keep winning some games, kind of maybe try to put some separation. You know, it does matter come the end of the year as far as being able to play that, you know, opening playoff series if you got to play them at home as opposed to in Vegas. And I think that would be important. Uh, otherwise, around the league, not too many, you know, wild stories. Montreal's regression, regressing pretty hard from their cup final uh, appearance. You know, uh, again, they're kind of the prime example for what I was talking about with the playoffs um, being very random. Um, they're 0 and 3, negative 7 goal differential. Buffalo 2 and 0, just like we all thought, right? Rebuilds complete. <laughs> they're they're going. Eichel was holding them back, just like we all all thought. Chicago continues their downward trend as they. I don't know. I don't know why they made that Seth Jones deal. We we knew this was the outcome anyway. We right? we saw this coming in the off season. Yeah. Oh boy. But it's you know it's too soon to really talk about most of that stuff. So the one thing I'm going to bring up as far as league wide stuff is I've noticed something so far this season, and maybe this will go away as the season continues. But I've noticed a ton of games with insanely high shots on goal totals. Now I don't know if hmm. you've noticed this or if anyone else has, but there has been nightly multiple games where at least one of the teams is over 40 shots on goal and a lot of times they're pretty close to 50 and and the other team will still be in like the mid 30s so like like a lot higher than a lot of other games that we've maybe seen in the past so you know that got me thinking is this just you know scorekeepers are being a little bit more generous as far as awarding shots on goal than they have been in the past or my kind of hypothesis, and I want to run this by you, is, is this analytics kind of really creeping into the on ice product where, you know, obviously common sense would say if you shoot more, you should score more. But uh, analytics is really kind of built on that in hockey. You know, as far as, you know, you were talking earlier about Fenwick, Corsi, all that stuff, a lot of how they, you know, devise all those analytics is is from shot totals right are, are more shots being taken for your team than against your team when you're on the ice okay well then you must be a positive player because you're helping drive offense the other direction as opposed to letting it you know kind of collapse in on your team so do you think this is analytics from a player perspective maybe creeping in where they're like okay we got i gotta throw shots on goal because that increases my analytic standings which more and more teams are using so this could help me get a better contract or is it like you know teams and coaching staffs going hey if we do this it makes you know our us look better for our next contracts as well but also it, it should be benefiting the team in the long run you know that's an interesting hypothesis and you know, Kyle, while you were explaining it, I was thinking maybe what, you know, why I would think that would be the case. Um, you know, as far as a player perspective, I think the players might tell you they're not thinking about that sort of thing. You know, on they're on the ice, they're just trying to make the right plays and, you know, help their team win and all the stock interview answers that you would get. Um, but one thing we do know is that, you know, analytics, more advanced stats, you know, Fenwick, Corsi, they are being used in contract negotiations now. That that's we know that to be a fact. Um, and when things do down the road potentially impact how much money you're making, it's it's something that maybe you think about. Um, I think there are other possibilities for why we might be seeing this. Um, the first one that came to mind, and just trying to put myself in the position of you know a player who's playing, is that early in the season you don't necessarily have you know all the the cohesion with your teammates necessarily or that experience to try and make that extra pass or make the extra play where you see your teammate and so you just kind of end up throwing a puck on net 
uh, that maybe later in the season, you know where your teammate is and you try and make a fancier play with it. Um, yeah, that's, I guess, one idea I had as to why that might be the case. Um, but I, I do like your theory there. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting phenomenon. I looked, I was looking at the NHL app while you were mentioning that and seeing the shots on goal totals, and they do look high to me compared to what I'm used to seeing. Yeah, it was just something I kind of noticed checking, you know, every couple times every night, like I do, right? Um, interesting. It doesn't seem to be affecting the games the Kraken are playing. And of course, the Kraken, we know, you know, use a lot of analytics in their front office. So it's kind of interesting that, that you know, we might be one of the exceptions to this new trend. If it is, even is a trend, it could all just be coincidence. It's very, very early on to say. Could just be that, you know, it's the start of the year, everybody's healthy, everybody's feeling good, so they're just kind of letting it rip, and later on in the season, it's, you know, <laughs> they're just going to be like, oh, I don't know, let me let me see if I can get a better shot off. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, it, it was just something interesting, and I, I wanted to bring it up. But uh, that's going to kind of do it for us as far as league-wide stuff. Not too much, you know, surprises or anything big going on. It's it's still early for a lot of stuff, as we said. So we're going to go ahead and, and enter the last segment of this week's podcast where, you know, we're going to look ahead. Next Saturday is the home opener for the Seattle Kraken. We had talked about doing a video in the past, RJ, as far as, you know, what we wanted the game day experience to be. It kind of got lost in the shuffle. We were reminded of it um, during the post-game live. Sergeant Pickles would let us forget. So we're going to kind of close out the, the podcast this week talking about what we'd like to see from you know the Seattle Kraken as far as game day experience stuff goes. So, RJ, why don't we start with the National Anthem? Because that's one of the first things that happens in every game, right? Uh, yep. And so we, we have been approached, well, we were approached outside T-Mobile Arena uh, in Vegas by someone. We had kind of seen this on Twitter, in the comments section before. Do you want to kind of fill everybody in on what I'm talking about? Yeah, so the idea is, uh, you know how around the league, some teams, if there's a relevant word in the national anthem, the fans will, you know, kind of yell it along. Um, the Golden Knights, we, we were in Vegas, we said, you know... Um, you know, when the word night comes up in the national anthem, everyone yells night, you know, star, the Dallas stars do stars. Um, there is the idea that for the Kraken, um, when there's rockets, red glare, we should all yell red glare, meaning the eye, that eye of the Kraken that we see in the logo. So that's the idea. Yeah. And I think it's a fantastic idea. Agreed. Agreed. I think that's awesome. I like it's creative you know, it works with the anthem in a way that other teams do. And um, that's something that, you know, is a, is a big part of like the logo and the imagery around the Kraken too. It's that red glare of the eye that comes out at you. I mean, you know, we made sure to include that in our, you know, Emerald City Hockey mm -hmm. logo where you've got the red glare on it too. So it's uh, something that could be kind of a part of the team and a good way to bring everyone together at the start of a game. Yeah. And that's kind of what I liked about it is it's, it's a little more subtle than just like, oh, it's the name of our team, right? Like the Dallas Stars. Stars. <laughs> yeah, but but it's it's still very much, you know, on brand for the team. It's a, it's a central part of the logo of the crest. And uh, I think it's a fantastic idea. So, you know, getting the word out on this podcast, tell all your Kraken buddies, you know, that you see from here on out. Let's try to try to see if we can make that happen, because I do think that that's just a, a fun thing that helps, you know, kind of build a fan base, build that, you know, shared community aspect of going to a game um, is it, just those moments of unity, really. Right. So um, just wanted to start with that. I, I felt that that was probably the most important one to get out there, because that's you know really the one we wanted to be proactive about as far as everything we're going to be talking about. One of the other things we talked about um, in the post game show for that Vegas game, though, RJ was the you know lack of a mascot for the Kraken so far. Still no word on whether or not we'll have a mascot um, at this point. We got to think if it's going to make a debut, it would be on Saturday. I guess it's possible that there's a mid season reveal, but I don't know. They've had. A decent amount of time to kind of come up with what they want to do and i would think you know come up with something but i mean are we both in favor of there being a mascot yes i am i i think it's just it's fun it's something you you want to do as a team and have a mascot and it's something that you can 
be creative about. I mean, this is, you know, the Kraken are known for, you know, kind of thinking outside the box, doing things a little differently. I want to see what they could come up with. You know, I think a, a mascot is a great tool to get fans engaged. And I know the Kraken, you know, are passionate about trying to engage all sorts of fans uh, and get them into hockey. And I think the mascot's a good co- tool to do that. So personally, I think we'll see some kind of grand reveal at the home opener. You know, I don't have any information to, you know, to back that up with, but I think that's what we end up seeing. And I, I'm looking forward to it if that's the case. Yeah, me too. I, I really want there to be one. Um, I, I just think it's a lot of fun. I think it's fun for people of all ages. I know we tend to think of mascots for, for kids, but, you know, come on. You like, like we all don't still get kind of excited when we see the team's mascot doing something. You know, especially when they like do fun stuff. Obviously, you know, you you're shark you were a Sharks fan before all this. We both kind of grew up going to Sharks games when like he would rappel down from the rafters. Like it's just cool to see somebody in this big costume do do something like that. I, I'm sorry, it it does get you excited for for the game and being in the space, and that's that's what it's ultimately all about. Is you know. Obviously, we want to see our team win, but we also, you know, we want to get our money's worth for for going to that game. We want we want a little bit of a show, right? So building off that, we obviously had quite the show in Vegas at that home opener for them. Oh, yeah. Um, One of the big things that they have been doing throughout the years since they've been in the league is they've been using the ice to project images on. Now, of course, they have the actual Golden Knight out there who will interact with the images. We saw that in this past game you know, that you and I were at where they had a Kraken, you know, kind of break its way up through the ice and kind of corner him. And then, you know, he like did something and there was some rays of sunlight and the Kraken like shriveled up and burned away. That wasn't great, but it was still, (laughs) it was still like a really fun thing. And I know it's cheesy, but it, it's effective. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. I mean, Everybody just it, it kind of went silent for a little bit as the as the ice started to crumble with the Kraken coming in. Like, yeah, everyone was impressed by that all around us. We could see it. And this is something we've been talking about just kind of amongst ourselves for years, because junior hockey teams have not been shy at all about using ice projections. And they've been able to do some really cool things with it. And for whatever reason, NHL teams just have been hesitant to do that in any kind of creative way. Occasionally, you'll just see like team logo projections on the ice or whatever. But, you know, it's it's lacking that creative aspect. And, and it's more limited than what you can really do with it. Uh, so that's something I'm hoping that we see for opening night. It's a really kind of set the mood. Yeah, and... You brought up junior teams. I've thought the Halifax Mooseheads have been doing an excellent job of this for a really, really long time. Um, You and I, when we were at game six of the Stanley Cup finals in 2016, when it was our two teams playing against each other, Penguins and the Sharks, they did, you know, kind of pregame just while everybody was still coming in and stuff. They did project like a water effect on the ice and they had like sharks swimming through it. And that was pretty cool. It Mm -hmm. kind of made it look like a Laguna. Um, didn't use it for really anything else during that experience. But I think that kind of gives an idea of what, you know, the Kraken could be using it for is make it the ocean, right? Have the glowing red eye down there, right? You can, you could do a lot of stuff. And I, I don't want to straight up copy from Vegas as far as having like a performer out there doing something or interacting with it. But I do think it does add something even more so on top of just the projection because there is that kind of live theater aspect. And I mean, live theater has been an entertainment staple since, you know, humankind has created art. So (laughs) I I, I think I don't think it would exactly be a bad thing to add some kind of live theater element to to everything, whether that's, you know, we have like a, a ship somewhere that the Kraken's going to go get right. And we just stick the Mm -hmm. opposing jerseys on some guys and they, you know, end up getting sunk by the Kraken and you see the glowing red eye or something. I don't know that again, it might be cheesy, but Vegas, the Vegas show was kind of cheesy and yet we were all engaged and, and it added to the experience. And I walked away feeling like I saw something and you know, that's, that's more than I could say for some other NHL games I've been to. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, when it comes to, you know, the experience and especially the cheesiness, I think it's something that kind of works for Vegas. And, you know, you want to feel like you've seen a show. And um, 
I think it's it's worth mentioning that for the Kraken game day experience, like the two big names going to be working on it are Lamont Buford and Johnny Greco. Johnny Greco did help create the Golden Knights experience, you know, in-game experience. So he's got some experience with that. You, and you can kind of see what, you know, what he worked on in the past when you go to Vegas games. And he's mentioned that he wants something that's going to fit for the city he's in. So you take that Vegas experience with the night and everything on the ice and it plays really well there. But I don't know how well that exact type of thing would work in Seattle. Uh, I just don't think it fits the city. Seattle's a very different city than Vegas. Um, And so I think you have to have something that kind of, you know, fits for here. And in that case, I kind of want to lean into the the nautical theme that the team has done so far. Um, And I mean, you mentioned like having a ship on the ice or something. But I'd also kind of lean into the concept of the Kraken still being hidden and lurking beneath the water. That's something the team has tried to emphasize and almost setting the scene where the crowd, you know, kind of, I don't know, is or helps out the Kraken, you know, to create a hostile environment. I almost picture like, you know, making people feel like they're out on choppy waters in a storm and it's loud and they're, you know, it's this menacing environment for the the opponent who's coming in. And that's, I don't know, kind of the, kind of the the scene that i would like to set if that makes sense yeah no it totally does and i i definitely you know i i agree with that i think that would be a lot of fun i think that probably suits seattle a little bit more than a yeah a totally cheesy vegas style show um and you could have a lot of fun with that as you said you could make it loud um I think both of us were very impressed with how loud that Vegas show was, just the PA system in general. You could, you know, kind of copy that effect over and, you know, as you said, have storm noises, thunder going, all that kind of stuff really, really could make for an interesting and unique game day experience for the Kraken, um, which is ultimately what we want. One thing, some teams do it, some teams don't. When the players skate out onto the ice, they'll, you know, sometimes they'll skate through something, right? Obviously, the San Jose Sharks, they've got the big shark head. Vegas Golden Knights, they skate through the helmet. Um, do we want something like that for the Kraken? I'm not sure I could. I was able to think of anything that I thought would work well. Um, again, you don't want, like, them to skate through a Kraken, per se. Especially. No, because you can't show the Kraken, right, so that it, doesn't work. Yeah. I don't think, like, a, I don't know, a ship wouldn't work, you know, I... I I just can't think of anything that would that would really work well. Um, I mean, like, a, oh, I mean, I guess you could do a um, like a like a I don't know, like lighthouse or like a buoy type thing. I just I don't know. I can't think of anything that would work. Maybe you know, maybe the game day experience people have thought of something that we haven't. But I just also don't think it's it's necessary if you you know do everything right around it. And at the end of the day, it's still just copying. You know, I think the Sharks were the first team to do that, right? I, I don't know specifically. As far as I know, they but might have been. It, though. It's copying an idea that's already kind of been done, and I think it's eh, not so much stale, but just you know, it, it's been done enough times by enough different teams. I don't think it it's really necessary that you do it. Yeah, the only thing I was thinking is we haven't seen a team yet incorporate the on ice projection with it. So as you were saying, I kind of got this idea as you were talking about making it maybe like a storm and it's hostile. You could have some like large swells and then kind of some cresting waves and then boom, maybe it's kind of like a 3D wave kind of thing that the players start coming out of. And that can maybe be for an interesting effect if you if you blend the two mediums together. But yes, otherwise, I was going to say I couldn't think of anything good for it. And and I'm not sure we need it or um or necessarily want it but you know just checking the boxes of all the stuff you know that uh, people might want us to talk about as far as this um you know we've talked in the past about like food i think everyone you know you want a variety of food and alcoholic beverages and regular beverages and you want them affordable it seems like those two things are impossible at any sporting event these <laughs> days but but you know i'll mention that that's something we would like to see um Otherwise, you know, everything else is pretty standard. There's going to be merch, you know, a team store, all that stuff. Uh, so I think the only thing we have left, RJ, is probably what people are wanting us to talk about the most, which is why we, of course, saved it for last just to string everybody along, um, <laughs> is the music, right? Yep. That's, that's one of the things 
whether it's, you know, to pump up a crowd as the team skates out for the first time, get the crowd going after a goal has been scored to help, you know, keep that energy alive, just intermission stuff just to, you know, keep you maybe moving in your seat, stretch those legs a little bit, um, make that time pass a little bit faster while you're waiting for the next period to start. Music is a very integral part of the NHL experience and the hockey experience, right? I mean, they do this in rec league games, beer league games, all over the, the you know the continent, all over the world. So, um, as far as songs go, RJ, why don't we start? You know, there's not always a pregame skate song, right? That's not necessarily mm-hmm. a total staple, but generally you'll have music going. Um, so I thought of something for the pregame skate. Obviously, Seattle has just this wide range of fabulous musical choices that we can, you know, stick very much with Seattle and not have to look too far out from that. Um, one of the one of the of course the people everyone thinks of when they think of Seattle music is Jimi Hendrix. Mm-hmm. His style of music, though, maybe isn't great for you know trying to get a crowd totally amped up to do something or or keep that energy going at a really high level. Uh, His music is known for, you know, being associated with with other kinds of, you know, relaxation and and stuff of that nature. So I thought the pregame skate would be a good chance to kind of bring in that Jimi Hendrix experience where it's, you know, it's a little more mellow to begin with, right? Everybody's still coming into the arena. You're just kind of establishing that mood. The players are just warming up. So I think things, you know, start off with like Voodoo Child or something for the pregame skate. And you can probably just rotate through a couple of his songs and just kind of have that be the moment where we honor him uh, before the game. You know, I think that's a good spot because, I, I mean, being said, you want to you want to incorporate Jimi Hendrix in there somehow. And I, I agree that the pregame skate doesn't need to be, you know, all amped up. And that's something I see from other teams where it's, you know, just played at the loudest volume, you know, like usually heavy bass or some, you know, songs like that, where it's just, I don't know, they're, they're trying to like go all out from, you know, at the pregame warmups. And it's just not necessary, I think, at that point. Um, and it also can kind of, you know, drown out some of the player sounds that I think it's is fun for the fans to hear. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do like that idea. And for a lot of the music stuff, I'm going to kind of defer to you. You're definitely more musically inclined than I am. Um, so I, I'm interested to hear kind of your opinions going through this. I mean, the only, the only thing I could, you know, really think of as far as music is just kind of to set the mood and, you know, maybe have a few, um, I don't know, just like independently made, just kind of nautical type, you know, I don't want to say sea shanties, but just, you know, like that, those type of song, that type of music to, you know, set that mood. That was one of the things I thought of was sea shanties. And I thought that's perfect for the second intermission break, right? Yes. The second just intermission. have one there that like everyone sings. Yes. Yeah. You know, games probably started at like 7.15 was the actual puck drop. Come second intermission. It's, you know, it's nine o'clock somewhere in there. Everybody's, you know, maybe getting a little tired. You've been sitting for a while. That's just something fun just to kind of change things up and get you re-engaged with things. Even if you're just laughing at it, you're at least, you know, kind of waking up a little bit. So I am glad you brought that up. I was going to bring that up a little bit later. (laughs) All right. As far as um, the like, you know, introducing the players, the starting lineup, team skates out onto the ice right before the game actually starts, not for the pregame skate, you know, that's where you want something that is going to really amp everybody up. You want it to amp up your players. You want it to amp up the crowds, make sure that they're loud right from the get go, you know, let that other team know that they are playing in a hostile environment. Just, just get everybody going. Thought of a couple things. I, I feel like that's the best place. If you really wanted to work in smells like teen spirit, that's probably the best place for it. Um, you of course have the line of, you know, here we are now entertain us that kind of works with the start of a game still not sure it's it's the greatest song for a hockey game but figured I'd mention it I'm a big Soundgarden fan when we talk about all the grunge bands of the early 90s in Seattle I'm a Soundgarden guy so I thought Super Unknown would be good there Um, but you know one of the Seattle music staples when it comes to sports for the last you know half decade or so has been Macklemore 
Um, mm -hmm. Now, you and I, we're not like big Macklemore fans. We don't exactly listen to his music or anything that much. But I do think Can't Hold Us would be kind of a fun thing to come out to and have this, the players skate around. And it, you know, it kind of gets everybody together and like, you know, it, it would get the crowd unified. It's it's a good kind of Seattle. I don't want to say like Seattle strong, but it's it's a good song to just get everybody on that same page of you know, we got this, we're going to go out there and do it. We're going to beat these guys. You know, I, I just think that's, that's probably where I could find the best spot for Macklemore in kind of my ideas of what would be going on. And you have to have some Macklemore there. It's just, you have mm -hmm. to, it's this Seattle sports event. You have to. Yeah. So, and I, and I do like can't hold us. I think that's probably the song to choose. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, just felt like that was the best place for that. Um, penalty box song right? That's, that's something that needs to happen. Of course, we've got Alice in Chains, Man the Box. Yep. The it obvious one. Works on so many <laughs> levels. I've heard it in other arenas before, Montreal, Columbus, just on TV, right? You can sometimes hear yep. the bleed over. I've heard it in other places, but it, it'll just fit better in Seattle for the obvious reasons. So finally, RJ, last but certainly not least is the goal song. Yep, and during the preseason, I noticed they did go with Lithium as the goal song in, in Everett and Kent. I wasn't in Spokane, so I'm not sure, but I think they went with it there. What do you think? So that's the one I came up with as, as certainly the most likely. I think, you know, Nirvana, the biggest of those bands, most widely recognized nationwide, worldwide. Um, you definitely do want them represented in the experience, and I think that song is good. Of course, the chorus is very... Um, it, it's big, it's loud, it it does get you going. You feel that emotion that you want a goal song to to invoke. It, that song invokes that. So I, I don't have a problem with it being lithium. I, I would bet a lot of money it's lithium. But I'll, I'll just go ahead and give an alternative. Again, I'll come back around to Soundgarden just, just because I say Rusty Cage just because it starts with that awesome guitar part. You could just kind of do that through that initial and then come in, you know, kind of cut it right up to the chorus for that with the with the hit. And I think that would be a lot of fun um, as a goal song. Just just because be a little different. Think outside the box of Nirvana, but it, it's going to be lithium. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I think that's it as far as game day experience, as far as things we want to see. Right. Yeah. I mean, the one thing I did want to add before we before we finished is one thing that I that I always think about with Seattle and and something you know where uh, Greco and and Buford have kind of talked about wanting to lean into what makes the experience special based on the city. And one thing I always think of is the fans. And it's not just the you know cliche. Oh, we've got the best fans in sports. You know, in Seattle. But one thing that truly makes Seattle fan sports fans unique is just how loud they can get. And we see this. You know, with Seahawks games and the Twelves, we see it with the you know atmosphere at Sounders games, um, and those are both in outdoor venues, and they've you know still caused like seismic activity. I cannot wait to hear how loud the crowd can get, um, in, you know, in an arena in an indoor venue where the sounds all going to be projected down toward the ice. Um, I think the team really should kind of lean into that and and just see how loud the building can get. So that's. Might be the thing I'm even looking most forward to is just, especially if they like score an early goal, you know, in that home opener, just how loud the arena gets. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've seen NFL teams kind of compete to see who could, who has the loudest arena, right? The loudest stadium. Mm -hmm. it, it would be really cool if Seattle, you know, pulls up that decibel reader and and proves that we could be the loudest fans in the NHL. I think that would be something that would be really fun and, and something we can do. Uh, I guess real quick, something else just to bring up is that we'd like as part of the game day experience, certainly for opening night, I would like some sort of video honoring the history of Seattle hockey, going back to the Metropolitans and, and everything, of course, since then. Um, you and I kind of talked about on the post game show. I'd love it if there was a Stanley Cup banner for the Metropolitans team that won in 1917, I think that would be a lot of fun. And I think that would be a really cool thing. Um, you know, most arenas have some form of like kind of history of the organization or history of hockey in the city section where they'll have, you know, stuff behind glass and memorabilia and stuff. Obviously, I'm sure Seattle will have something like that. But I think to have to really bring that extra something in 
to the arena itself into that experience, I think would be really, really cool. Agreed. All right. So that's going to do it for this episode of the podcast. Got three games coming up this week. Monday, we've got Philadelphia Flyers. Tuesday, we've got the New Jersey Devils. And then, of course, on Saturday, that home opener against the Vancouver Canucks. So a lot of fun cracking hockey ahead. Can't wait to watch it all, talk about it all with you guys on the postgame show. Make sure to stop by to that. If you haven't already, give it a try. It's a lot of fun. Otherwise, we will see you next time. 